Bet the Board presents Stay Green. Stay Green is your first stop for all the metrics, matchups, and money making opportunities at the track each race week. This is Stay Green, the NASCAR betting podcast. Here are your hosts, Todd Furman and racing analyst Chris Wormy. A three quarter of a mile high tire wear track last weekend at Richmond with one of the more improbable pre week winners of the entire season, Chris Busher, into the playoffs to the two mile oval high speed track we'll see this weekend at Michigan International Speedway. Welcome into the Stay Green podcast, a bet the board production part of the Wondery Podcast Network. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by professional better and racing analyst Chris Wormy. And Wormser, I know this week may not be the most exciting track for you to handicap, but there has to be a little bit of nostalgia because this by default is your home track in the Irish Hills of Brooklyn, Michigan. Yeah, I it is it's crazy. I've only been there once. And because my my NASCAR career uh, or betting career kind of started out here in Arizona, so I've only made it back one time. And, you know, it, it was repaved. I can't remember how many years ago, but, you know, high tire wear tracks are typically our, our favorite kind of tracks to bet. There's still not a lot of tire wear here and, and not my favorite track to bet. However, there is that, uh, you know, hometown love for Michigan. And I think a lot of the manufacturers say, share that same hometown love as you have, you know, Detroit right there. So still, a, it's still a track where there's some money to be made, but again, not my favorite track uh, to get involved with. Some unique opportunities, and we'll get to some of the track comparisons, as I know it's one of the hotly contested issues this week in the NASCAR betting community, but more on that in Stage 3. For those folks that find themselves listening to the Stay Green podcast for the first time, we'll lay out a little bit how the format around these parts works. Stage 1, all about what we learned last weekend from Richmond. Stage 2, a betting market that's a unique offering, not available at every shop that fascinates Chris and I a little bit, so we'll delve into that. Normally, it's betting basics, or when we have a chance to speak to a prominent personality in NASCAR, that's where we would allocate time for accordingly. And stage three, all about the upcoming race weekend, the drivers to watch, and everything bettors need to know to try and get themselves to the window. So to kick off stage one, Worm, when we look at Richmond, I mentioned Chris Busher at the top of the show, as high as 80-1 to one pre-week to win the race. I mean, you went through a lot of the data. You thought he'd be good. I'm not sure you believed he'd have a race-winning ride by all accounts, when you look at the absolutely sweltering heat for the day that saw only one caution for an on-track incident, obviously it takes a physical toll on drivers, crew chiefs, and spotters alike. Every car in the 36-car field finished the race, the first time the full field was running at the end since hmm. 2018. Penalties, slow pit stops, that, of course, changed the dynamic of the race. And unfortunately for a driver that you were extremely bullish on, that may have taken him out of contention or we would have had the chance to cash right around 60 to one. Yeah. I, the no one wanted to win that race. And and I don't want to take anything away from Chris Busher. I mean, that 17 team, they were on it all day. They made no mistakes and they had a really fast race car. They were happy in practice. I thought that they were running competitive lap times um, kind of throughout the entire day when, when you were looking at where he started, uh, and kind of was working his way through the field. So obviously he had a great car. So I don't want to take anything away from him, but there were a lot of cars that threw this race away. If you look at a guy like, uh, you know, we were very heavy on Eric Almarola and he was an absolute rocket ship. I think after the first stage, he worked his way up from 26 to 10th or between 24 and 26, all the way up to 10th uh, and, and had a super fast race car. Unfortunately, when you make mistakes under green flag conditions, you are in trouble and that was what the 10 the 20 because chris bell was also really fast i mean remember he passed martin truex truex got a kind of slipped early in the race chris bell ended up going by him and you pass martin truex i don't care what track it's at right now if you're passing martin truex you have a really fast race car the chris bell was able to get by truex then you look at a guy like um tyler reddick who had a really fast race car put it on the pole goes out there and just dominates on stage one commitment cone violation the same violation that you saw eric amarola have and then you have uh 
you know, Brad Keselowski, who hasn't won a race in, I don't know, some 80 something races, go out there leading and, and it almost had like a seizure on pit road. I don't know what happened. I was actually listening to his radio and it was like, you know, I listened to all, I was listening to his radio. And then I also listened to his comments after the race. He acted like he, he just didn't have any like rear grip with the tires and that's why, but no, he was going to miss his pit stall. That's what happened. Cause they were like, Hey, pit, 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 pit. Hey, we're right here. (laughs) And, um, but fortunately his teammate was able to, to run a flawless race. So hats off to Chris Buescher, a really impressive win. Yeah. We mentioned Chris Buescher second most laps that he's ever led in a race during his cup career. You talked about the awkward stop that Brad had, or it could have been the six in victory lane. One thing that's worth highlighting because it's a racing team that we've absolutely trashed seemingly week in, week out. Shout out to Stuart Haas Racing. All four of their cars finish inside the top 11. Good day for Fords in general at a track where the aero deficiencies clearly didn't create any problems. I guess it begs the question, do we think some of that momentum there can carry over to a track where they've done very well? Or we're talking about apples versus oranges with a three quarter of a mile flat track with high tire wear versus one of the fastest tracks in the cup series, the two miles that we're going to see this weekend in Michigan. Yeah. I think that, you know, we're going to dig into some of the track comps and I have something, a little interesting uh, conversation that I had earlier this week. I think that it, it was, had to be super positive for SHR. They just unloaded fast. I mean, this wasn't something where, uh, you know, even though there, there was a ton of strategy throughout this Richmond race, it wasn't strategy that had these SHR cars running fast. I mean, they, they unloaded fast. They, I think yep. they had great setups. Everyone felt really positive about their cars. Uh, I know that, you know, qualifying when you have the big t- temperature differential and you have a group, a group and B group, you're going to have, you're going to have some discrepancies in qualifying versus actually how good the car may be, especially when it comes to race trim. So I think SHR has to feel great walking away from this race, uh, especially when they've struggled, you know, here as of the last you know month or two. So um, I think that it's, you know, and then you're heading to Michigan where the Fords have, have dominated. So I think that SHR has to be feeling good about this. Unfortunately, you know, Kevin Harvick's the only guy that actually has a chance to, um, you know, get anything done in the playoffs, at least at this point. So uh, we'll see what happens, you know, with these few races leading up to we get well, first round of the playoffs is what Darlington. And that's just yeah, a couple weeks away. Right, right around the corner, Labor Day weekend. So we're talking Michigan, two road courses, and then, of course, the ultimate wild card in the equation, yep. Daytona, the final race of the regular season. With the sweet, though, comes the SAR. The, with the sweet comes the sour, not the sorrow. Easy for me to say oh as I can spit God. this out right around these parts. Uh, if we're going to praise SHR, we have to question uh, the way that HMS unloaded. Look, no reason to panic by any stretch of the imagination. You and I have talked about how the summer isn't exactly illustrative of what these race teams are going to provide when the stakes get ratcheted up in the postseason. But there wasn't one HMS car in contention. And hell, it felt like they were lucky to have any of them finish on the lead lap. Yeah, this is this is, I think, a theme that's going to be important to think about leading up to the playoffs is where are all their resources focused right now? I think the nine car, I think it has to be the nine and the 48. Listen, they they have Byron is safely in the playoffs. Kyle Larson safely in the playoffs. I know that Byron maybe has a small chance, small outside chance at at winning the regular season points. I think they're going to be devoting resources to that. But for the most part, they need four cars in that playoffs. And right now, I think it's all hands on deck for the nine. It's all hands on deck for the 48. And is that going to make some of these other teams struggle because the nine and the 48 have not been in the same zip code when it comes to speed relative to the the five and the 24. And are they trying to compensate? Is that taking away resources? And I'm not talking about massive resources, but uh, is that taking something away from this five team and the 24 team in order to make sure that they can secure one, maybe two more teams in the play or two more cars in the playoffs? I don't know because I'm not there, but I think that that would be a good, good explanation as to why HMS might be struggling right now. Meanwhile, the nine has been the model of consistency. The problem is it's not consistently top three or top five finishes. It's hovering in that eighth place range up to 12th, which to his credit has been able to chip away at the points deficit. We'll get to the nine in terms of what we feel his playoff prospects are, but something to factor in as we wave the green, white checkered flag. And we put a bow on stage one for this episode of stay green. You can follow Chris on, I guess we're calling it Twitter still or X. I don't even know at this point at Chris Wormy 15. 
I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, for all things Bet the Board, follow Bet the Board Pod. And we do have some new content breaking there. As we've reminded you countless times, there is a bevy and a boatload of college football previews to get you guys ready for week zero, which will be here right around the corner the weekend of August 26th. But we're finally kicking things off with eight divisional previews for the National Football League. We know if you're betting NASCAR, there's a good chance that you're betting the NFL on Sundays. (laughs) Just the same. As we get into stage two, Wormser, Uh, We found a unique market, and while we're extremely critical of a lot of the sports books out there and the way that they handle NASCAR almost as a redheaded stepchild of sorts, I do have to give them props when they think outside the box and give NASCAR enthusiasts a unique way to try and tie up their money for interest-free loans for the foreseeable future. And William Hill put out a market for odds to make the final four. Now, I do have to be a little bit critical because there aren't yes, no prices uh, on a lot of the high profile drivers. There are only yes prices, which, you know, can create a little bit of opportunity if you look through it. But as we go through some of the numbers here, Martin Truex, I guess we'll call him the de facto favorite to make the final four right around even money. Denny Hamlin, his teammate at plus 120. Then it's William Byron, Kyle Larson and Kyle Busch, all priced less than two to one. It's Christopher Bell and Ryan Blaney in that two to one, three to one range. Chastain and Logano at three to one, Chase Elliott, Kevin Harvick, Tyler Reddick, and Brad Keselowski at plus 450, Busher at six to one. And then you're looking at Bubba Wallace and Ty Gibbs at 15 to one. Now, this is a market that's a little bit unique. It's not one that I've handicapped extensively in the past. But when you see a market like this, do you think there are angles worth exploiting from a handicapping standpoint? Or if you're looking to make a case for one of the favorites here, you may be better off adding a ticket on Truex or a ticket on Hamlin to win the whole damn thing and round it out knowing that we have some good numbers in our back pocket, as listeners do, with a little bit of Kyle Larson exposure and Kyle Bush as well. Yeah, I what I, I, I certainly don't like favorites in this scenario because there's one of them is going to have trouble. And especially if you look at a guy like Denny Hamlin, listen, there's you have a... You, also with these tracks so the first three races darlington kansas and bristol if we we think about those those are that's a a reddick type track a kyle larson type track denny hamlin type track so i anticipate those guys to be really good and i think truex is going to be fast everywhere but you know it only takes one blown tire or one mistake late in the race in order to really hurt your finish if that happens twice in a round you, you're probably going to need to win uh depending on who the other drivers are that make yep. this the final, right? Like if Chase Elliott gets in there, I think you're probably going to need to win. If it's Michael McDowell, you might not need to win, right? So obviously it's about your competition as well. You have to make sure that you're looking at the tracks individually and you have to look at, you know, what are those final three races and, and who can win those? Because a win in those final three races and man, you're, you're home free. If you ask, Joey Logano last year, what the most important race of the year was outside of the championship, he would say Las Vegas. And that's where he was able to get his win, cement himself in the playoffs. And then he was able to take Homestead and Martinsville and say, hey, you know what, guys, let's just focus all of our efforts on Phoenix. Yep. And and so who are the guys that ran well at Las Vegas? I think that that's really important. Who runs well at Homestead and who runs well at Martinsville? You have to hope that your your luck um, kind of cancels out in the first you know, six races. So you're looking at the first six. Okay. Who are the guys that are just going to run consistently? If you're, if I'm taking a favorite, I like William Byron and here's why his pit crew has been phenomenal on pit road. It's almost been a weapon. He qualifies well, week in and week out. Whenever you qualify well, it lowers your chances of getting caught up into a random wreck. Also, He hasn't had many mistakes and he's been rewarded for it. He's been able to win races that he maybe shouldn't have won where he might not have been the best car just because he's been in the top three for that final restart. So my favorite should be William Byron, in my opinion. So if you're looking at the favorites, I do like that William Byron price. But when it comes to some of the other value plays, just who are the consistent guys right now? I think that this sport rewards consistency because Uh, You know, you look at a guy like Kevin Harvick, he doesn't have a win this year, but he's always kind of running around the top five. And if you're going to give me Kevin Harvick at four and a half to one, I don't think that's a terrible price. If you look at a guy like how do you have Chase and and Harvick kind of priced the same way when you have one guy that's for sure in and then you have a guy like Chase Elliott who he still needs to get he needs to win or get really lucky to point his way in. So I think it's really important to kind of break it down into the stages of of the playoffs and also I, I 
I should I would think that consistency is more important than speed at this point. And I think the other thing, when you're looking at a market like this, let's see if the sports book decides to keep this up after individual races we see in the yeah. playoffs, or if it's a market that completely disappears when we know the field of 16 and we head to Darlington, because as we saw last year, Christopher Bell was the ultimate magician. I mean, he pulled a rabbit out of his yeah. hat, not once, but twice to try and get through. And you think you have a good number working in your favor. Suddenly it's a winner go home type scenario. And you could be sitting at a long shot price at 75 or 100 to one for one of these drivers to win the whole damn thing. And you can get a price just to win one race at Martinsville in that 15 or 18 to one range, which is a far cry from some of the price tags you're seeing here. Now, of course, if we could rub our crystal ball and have the foresight to see all of those things coming, you wouldn't be listening to stay green. You wouldn't be leaning on Chris's expertise on Sunday morning. And you guys would be sitting on a beach somewhere in the tropics, <laughs> being able to count your money uh, with reckless abandon. But, Either way, a fascinating market, and I just kind of wanted to peel back the curtain a little bit and get your thought process there for a unique illustration on stage two for just thinking outside the box and trying to find other ways and avenues that you're able to exploit some of the markets that are there. And look, some markets may create great opportunities to be bet into. Others may not offer the same upside. So it's all about the calculations and the calculus that you do on a week-in, week-out basis to figure out where you're able to glean some value. Green, white, checker flag on stage two, and we'll head into the longest stage of all, stage three, with our drivers to watch this weekend for the Firekeepers 400 at Michigan International Speedway. And when we talk about Michigan, we'll lay out the track specs for you. It's a two-mile oval in the Irish Hills, a stone's throw from the town of Brooklyn. Known as a sister track of Texas, was used as a blueprint for the formerly two-mile oval at Fontana, albeit one with none of the tire wear that we've known to come and love until Fontana was put out to pasture earlier this season. A wide racing surface with 18 degrees of banking, modest by stock car standards, a little bit different for open wheel racers. And it's one of the fastest tracks in NASCAR due to its wide sweeping corners, long straightaways, and lack of restrictor plate requirements here. Typical qualifying speeds, excess of 200 miles an hour or have been in the past. Corner entry speeds, anywhere from 200 plus miles an hour, approaching 220 after the repave of the track occurred back in 2012. I lay all of that out for you, Chris, to ask you this question, my friend. Are there any comps that you are going to lean into for data that'll factor into some of your decision-making process this weekend? Yeah, I, I'm kind of at a loss usually when it comes to this, this particular question here at Michigan, mainly because you know we do have a similar track when it comes to Fontana, but there's so much tire wear. There's no strategy at Fontana. If you run three laps gr uh, green flag racing at Fontana, you're coming down and you're taking four tires. If you run three three green flag laps at Michigan, not one person is going to pit unless it gets you inside of a, a fuel window of some sort. So whenever that's the, you know, if you can say that about any track, they're very, very different. And, you know, there's some people that talk about Vegas and they talk about, um, you know, they talk about Kansas. You really don't hear much like Darlington or anything like that because there's just way too much tire wear. But I also think there's too much tire wear at Vegas and Kansas and Charlotte for that matter. So those are all mile and a half tracks as well. Whereas you're looking at a two mile track in Phoenix or at, uh, at Michigan. Now I did have to call our friend, Brian Murphy. Um, always and, good and to get Murph's perspective on things. Well, and, and it wasn't one of those kind of like, well, I just had a question. What's the closest comp. It was like a conversation like, Hey, hear me out and see if I'm <laughs> like, can we have a conversation about this? Because I just didn't want like a yes, no answer. And I, I was, I was under the impression there's really not a comp track. If I had to choose, I would say that the Indy Oval, which we haven't gone to in this with this car yet, would be the closest comp. The next closest comp would be Texas because there's not a lot of tire wear. Um, you're you're a, a lot of on throttle time in the corners as well, which is usually terrible for racing, but that's the deal at, at Texas and Michigan. And then I do like the idea, you know we talked about trimming out your car and that's not something you typically hear in NASCAR. This is more of an Indy car discussion, especially at the Indy 500. You talk about, Hey, do we want to be trimmed out and be fast in the straights? Or do we want a little bit more downforce, which gives us more grip in the corners. And that's the conversation that these teams are having right now throughout the week. And then we kind of, I don't know that we got sidetracked. We started talking about even a place like Atlanta where Obviously, this is a super speedway type race with a package, but you're you want to be trimmed out, but you can't be so trimmed out that you are 
are off the throttle too much in the corner. So it's this trade off between downforce and, you know, arrow on the straights. And so I would say, I think the most important track that we're looking at, obviously we have not gone to Texas yet this year. So I think that, you know, when we go to Texas, we might be able to look back at Michigan and say, Hey, the cars that were fast there were also fast. Um, could well, assuming, also assuming the tires hold this year at Texas. Yeah. I th- I would hope Goodyear got that right. <laughs> you screw that up again. And I think you're in big trouble. So I think that it's important to understand Pocono. Were you fast on that, that long pond straight away at Pocono that that's going to show speed in your race car. Remember, even qualifying speeds are going to be slower than the race speeds because you're going to be in a pack. You're going to have the draft. You're going to run faster in the race than you are in qualifying. At least that was the case last year. I anticipate the same thing this year. However, you do have a different setup. You're probably going to have your shocks. You're going to travel more. It's a much more bumpy track at Pocono than it is at Michigan. Super smooth, lots of on throttle time. So I'm kind of looking at not necessarily, uh, I would say Atlanta, too much, but I think it's important to understand who was just fast there, who was able to trim their car out, who was able to qualify well, and who was able to kind of marry um, speed with downforce in the corner and handling. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Pocono is kind of the the, the test, but also Atlanta. Now, when I say Atlanta, I do not think Corey LaJoy is going to be fast. Okay, you that's not what my I'm joke. Saying. You stole my joke. I'm going. Should we be running to the window to bet Corey LaJoy? I don't top think three, Corey LaJoy is going to be 10. fast. You still have to be fast at Pocono too. So, uh, and, and obviously Corey was not as fast there as he was at, at, at a super speedway. So I know that that's a long explanation and a little bit convoluted, but it's really hard to, to actually nail down a specific track comp, but that's as close as I could get. So uh, we're going to try to go ahead and handicap this race using kind of keeping that in mind um, as we're looking at Michigan. Fair assessment, and when we look at Michigan as far as recent winners are concerned, a little bit of track history and trends. Toyota hasn't won at Michigan since 2015, and that's their lone Michigan Speedway win in their last 20 tries. Chevrolet, not much better. It's been the Blue Ovals, a perfect 8-0 at this track going back to 2018 with four different drivers reaching victory lane in those eight races, obviously dominated by Kevin Harvick. When we look at Hendrick Motorsports specifically, they haven't won a race at Michigan since 2014. And as far as the starting grid is concerned, five of the last seven Michigan winners have come from the top three starting spots. And if we want to go a little bit further, 11 of the last 13 have all come from inside the top 12. So you may want to pay attention to qualifying if you don't believe guys are going to be able to race their way through the field. When we look at individual drivers, nobody out there right now at most books priced less than seven to one. Of course, every book may vary. So we'll call Kyle Larson the de facto favorite as far as when we pulled some of these numbers, but he's not alone there at a price of seven to one. When we talk about Larson in his current form, struggled like most of Hendrick Motorsports at Richmond. He did win here at this, I mean, won at Richmond in the spring, but barely finished inside the top 20 last weekend. When you look at how he's performed, finished 19th or worse in three or four races, that does come with the caveat he was significantly better at Pocono than what his finish was, but just one podium finish overall since going to Kansas. Now, as far as his track history at Michigan, does have three career wins, six top fives, eight top tens, 220 laps led, and an average finish better than 12th in 14 races. His three wins came back to back to back in 2016 and 27 as a member of Ganassi. And we look at his last two trips here, seventh last season and third previously. Kyle Larson buying or selling his pre-week number right around 7-1. Yeah, you know, the one thing I don't like about Larson is he's just not trending faster. And and I think, you know, if you're looking at the big picture, you're looking at the championship and you're looking at the playoffs, I don't think you want to be peaking quite yet. I think it's better to peak, you know, in, in maybe a month or so. I know that that's, you know, super solid advice. Hey, you, you'd rather be good in the playoffs, especially when you're when you're for sure in. However, it, you know, he's just not trending fast. He hasn't he, he, last week was last week at Richmond was, I mean, he wasn't a lead lap car. Uh, I know that no. he, I think he took the wave around and ended up finishing on the lead lap, but that was not a lead lap performance out of that five team. They didn't unload fast and they weren't good, you know, short or long run. However, I do like him here. Remember that the Fords have won, you know, the last non Ford to win was Kyle Larson. He won three in a row. So, yep. and this was in, I, I would say lesser equipment. You know, I think that Ganassi, did not does not have the same equipment as Hendrick Motorsports. Another just uh, bombshell 
uh, statement there that Chip Ganassi does not have the same equipment. You're, as you're bringing Blaisdell. the goods today, buddy. Let I me am. tell you, I'm, you have I'm really dusted off the A-level material here for your yep. home track. Yep, you're welcome. But yeah, I guess all said and done, I actually do kind of like this price on Kyle Larson. Last year, he did finish seventh, but I think it was arguably he's probably a, a top three car. He did slip up kind of on that last restart. I think he slid back to like 13th or 14th place and was able to work his way back up to seventh. It's just so hard to pass here. You do have to kind of get to that outside. If you can get to the outside, it's much easier to pass. And we all know that if there's someone that's comfortable going to the outside at a track, it's definitely someone like Kyle Larson. I don't hate this seven to one price. If someone came to me and said they really like Kyle Larson this week, I would not hate uh, a pre-week bet on that. Can I interest you in the 11 car driven by Denny Hamlin at seven to one? When you look at Denny's current form, finished seventh, first and second in his last three races, accumulating 144 points during that span, five straight races with no finish worse than 14th. He's led laps in 11 of the last 14 races. Uh, so he's shown the, to be the model of consistency. When you look at his track history at Michigan, two wins, 11 top five, 17 top tens, 262 laps led with the 32 race sample size. Hasn't won here since 2011, but at the same time, he has led multiple laps in each of the last seven races at the track, led 38 laps here last season, and five straight finishes inside the top six in the Irish Hills. No wins during that stretch, but three finishes all inside the top three. And you can make the case that last year, if it wasn't for a bad pit stop, he may have had a chance to get to victory lane. Yeah, Denny, obviously Denny is running really, really fast right now. My only issue is it's so hard to pass here that if you make a mistake, even if you stay on the lead lap, it's going to take you a long time to get back to the front. You know, this isn't Richmond. So I know that there are guys that if you if you made a mistake, if you look at the guys that made mistakes last week in, in Almirola and uh, Chris Bell, those guys weren't able to recover because they were running like 15th and 17th at the time. And they did it under green flag conditions. So you're obviously going to go down a lap. Eric was able to unlap himself. Michigan's going to be a different scenario because it's really, really hard to pass. So I don't know that you can recover even if you're leading the race and you make a mistake. It's going to be really hard to get that clean air unless strategy comes into play. This is the one place where you could go down and instead of taking two tires or, or four tires, you could just go fuel only. As long as you're inside your window, tires don't really wear here. But it does take a little bit of luck. You're going to need to have a little bit of fortune, much like Kevin Harvick did last year where he was able to win the race. He was the one on pit road when they threw out the caution, pretty much inherited the victory. I just think that at this point in the week, it's really hard to go in on a favorite. I'd rather see him unload because I still don't think anyone's going to open less than seven to one. I, at least I don't think Butch books should open anyone shorter at seven to one. I don't care how fast a car looks because it is so hard to pass. If you lose your track position, it's much harder to drive through the field than a lot of other tracks. You're going to actually need strategy to get your way back up there. So at this point, I wouldn't blame anybody for betting Denny Hamlin, but I think I'd rather wait and, and see how he unloads. When we talk about favorites, we talk about drivers that have been consistently fast. No discussion is obviously complete without a mention of the 19 car and Martin Truex Jr. I've seen his number drift as far as nine to one at some shops, but we'll use eight to one for consensus purposes. And you look at his last three races, first, third, and seventh, he scored 137 points during that span. Does remain the leader in points with his three wins so far this season, has led laps in 10 of 13 races which encompass 709 of the 781 laps he's led so far this season. Top 10 finishes in seven of nine races, the two outliers, Atlanta and Chicago. As far as his track history at Michigan, six straight finishes, 10th or better, three top threes during that span. But Martin Truex Jr. has never made it to victory lane. He's 0 for 32, but has seven top six finishes in his last seven Michigan attempts. Yeah, this obviously, I think the 19 is going to be a rocket. He's been the fastest car, typically week in and week out. I think that last week was a bit of an anomaly. If you go back to Pocono, super fast. I thought he was the fastest car. However, he wasn't on the right strategy. And if you're not on the right strategy, it's not as hard to win as a place like Pocono. Whereas if you're not on the right strategy, you're out. You have no chance. Michigan, you know, it puts it a little bit more in the driver's hands. But still, if you're not on the right strategy, you can't win. So if you take a car that was equal to Pocono, he could still find himself in, you know, kind of running top three, but not a chance for the win. And I, I, I like this price a little bit more than I like the Denny price for a couple of reasons. Number one, 
I think he's just been faster than Denny outside of Richmond. I think he's been faster week in and week out than Denny. And they've made less mistakes. And if you go back to Richmond, he struggled a ton. And I thought he had a hell of a drive. And I say that like that's usually an F1 thing. Oh, what a great drive. You don't hear that that often in NASCAR. But <laughs> he was put out there on old tires more than anyone else. He was the only guy doing one-stop strategy uh, you know, over a 150 laps 150 lap runs where everyone else was doing two. He was put in a terrible position. He was able to hang on to track position. I like this price uh, on Martin Truex Jr. I think he's going to qualify well. I think he's going to unload well. Uh, and I think that we could see this price drop a little bit. I, I would not be opposed to anybody getting in uh, on this price at eight to one at this point. Well, in the week. William Byron, you talked a little bit about at the top, or I should say in stage two about his big picture outlook. As far as his current form, never a factor at Richmond, like most of his Hendrick Motorsports teammates, finished 13th or worst in four of his last five races. The one outlier was the race shortened win at Atlanta. But you mentioned Pocono, and he did lead 60 laps there. So clearly had speed on the long pond straightaway and an ability to stay up front. He's led the most laps of any driver in the Cup Series this year with 800-plus to his credit. As far as track history is concerned, just one top five and two top tens in eight races here. But he does have an average finish of ninth in his last four trips, and it always seems to be not a lack of speed that's held him back, but a little bit of self-inflicted wounds. William Byron, his price was as high as 11 to one at one prominent shop. That number has come down. You can find him widely available throughout the market at eight, eight and a half to one. I like Byron. I think that, you know, I think that Byron and Truex are, are, are going to be similar this week. If I had to give an edge on speed in the short run, I'd probably say Byron when it comes to qualifying. And I'd probably also give the edge to Byron. And then up until recently, I would have given the lack of mistakes uh, kind of award to Byron as well as, but Truex has done really, really well. I think that they that whole team has done well. I, I also like Byron at this eight to one price. I just can't imagine him qualifying outside the top 10. I think you're going to probably see a top five qualifying out of him. You know, the, the one kind of overhanging issue and, you know, I didn't really discuss it with Larson is how much effort is Hendrick putting towards some of these other guys. And I don't know if that's going to play much of a factor uh, as I, I don't know the ins and outs of what they're, how they allocate resources, whether it's manpower or. I mean, I thought other. you're tight with Jeff Gordon. I mean, you've dropped his name on this podcast. So I figured you had Jeff on speed dial. I'm well, can I just talk about how he said, nice to meet you. And he said, Todd, good to see you again. Uh, <laughs> that was a, you know, an ego check. Like I haven't Slice had, a humble you know, here I am. Worms are that doesn't have cars flying me out to Richmond. I think I'm a hot shot. And Jeff Gordon goes, nice to meet you, Chris. Oh, Hey Todd, how's it going? Um, <laughs> So that was definitely don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. He doesn't return my calls when I ask about HMS strategy and where they're out. No, okay. Their perfect. Either, though, so. I, that, but I'd be interested to see what does it mean? You know, if I could have a chance and, and maybe the next person that we get on here, um, you know, that there would be an analyst of some sort, what does it mean to kind of dedicate more resources to that? Uh, the, the 48 team and the 19, because Denny brought it up on his podcast. And I imagine that someone that's a team owner, when they say that they're going to dedicate more resources to someone else he knows what they're talking about so i'd be interested to hear what that is no it's a very fair assessment and we are efforting to get some big names before the end of the season on the podcast for our listeners out there you'd be amazed how many people don't return our phone calls texts or emails that we send out but oh, you know it doesn't we... stop us doesn't stop us from trying around these parts that is for sure uh kevin harvick when we look at the four car you mentioned the fact that he won here a season ago a lot had to do with strategy He's right now in that 10 to one range, current form, three straight top tens, uh, did end a run of three straight finishes at 24th or worse, 10 top tens this season to go along with six top fives. The problem for the four car is he hasn't shown a lot of race winning speed. He's only led 108 laps all season long. Now, as far as track history, he does have an opportunity to clinch a playoff spot. Even if he doesn't win Sunday's race, six wins, 16 top fives, 22 top tens, 737 laps led in 42 races here. His average finish is better than sixth if we go back to 2013. And as we talked about, he's won five of the last seven races at Michigan, ending a 65-race winless streak here a season ago. When you're looking at Kevin Harvick, last weekend, he practiced well. He unloaded he well. Great. But for all intents and purposes, he didn't have a car that I thought was ever really in contention no. or a threat to win that race. No, he, he's been a kind of a difficult guy to handicap throughout this year because if you look at last year, it was either – fade him or bet him to win the race and because he either looked terrible in practice or he looked like over the long run he was potentially the car that beat 
if you're looking at last year and you say, oh, Kevin Harvick won last year, and I'm going to use that same information to to kind of make my wagers this year, you'd be wrong because he literally had a lottery ticket fall in his lap. He was on pit road and passed the start finish line when they threw the caution. Well, that means that he was good on fuel for the rest of the race and he was on the lead lap. So he obviously inherited the lead. And now to, to Kevin Harvick's credit, he went out there and ran away with it. I think he won by three or four seconds. It wasn't even close where it was really hard for leaders to get away earlier in the race, but there's no doubt that Kevin Harvick had a fast race car. They said they thought that going into that week, him and Rodney Childers had said, this is the fastest car that we've had all year, but they still needed to get that track position and they weren't able to do it until they kind of had a lucky caution. Fast forward to this year. I think that Kevin Harvick has looked better in practice and qualifying than he did last year. However, that really hasn't translated into better finishes. It's he's been more consistent. He's a guy that you really can't fade week in and week out. He's obviously going to lock himself or probably or could lock himself into the playoffs this week. However, I think he's overvalued. I don't think Kevin Harvick, even winning last year, had a 10 to 1 type car. I thought he was a fifth to sixth, seventh place car. And, you know, you look at last week where I thought he was the best car after practice and qualifying. Uh, and, and I'm not saying he laid an egg, but he was never a threat to win the race. At, at no point was he the fastest car on the racetrack. So, I think at this point, I'm going to kind of pump the brakes on Kevin Harvick. I, I don't see him qualifying kind of in that top three to five. I think you're going to see some other guys like the Larsons, Byrons, Truex, and Hamlin, you know, kind of really be the favorites in this race. And I think Kevin Harvick, his price might even drift. And I'm not opposed to betting him if, if his price drip, drifts up to that 14 or 15 to one range, but 10 to one, uh, I don't like that price right now. Shame on me. I glossed over your favorite driver earlier at a price of eight to one in Kyle Busch. Oh, yeah. And when we look at Kyle Busch, current form wise, third place finish last weekend, he was uh, a little bit pessimistic about the short flat track program that we'd seen from RCR. Wasn't the case at all. He drove up through the field and was passing cars in some of those long green flag runs, finishing third, which marked his fifth top five result in the last eight races. 13 top 10 so far this season, eight of which have come in the last 10 races. If we back out his 36 place finish at New Hampshire, his average finish going back to Darlington is better than seventh. So clearly he's rounding into playoff form, but he hasn't led a single lap over his last five races. As far as track history is concerned, well, we talked about Fontana not being an apples to apples comparison. He did have the fastest car there and the horsepower to win on a two mile oval finished 36th in this race last season, but before that was consistently strong eight straight finishes of seventh or better, but hasn't been the victory lane at Michigan since August of 2011. But you have seen RCR perform at its best at mile and a half or greater tracks. Yeah. I, I, I was kind of hoping you weren't going to revisit this guy because the notes I have said, Todd, I don't know how to handicap this guy. Hey, at least don't. you're honest. Then it I mean that I makes mean, for a quick it, handicap, and we can move forward from there. <laughs> well, he, I just think that it's important to realize when you're looking at at a place like Richmond. He qualified on the front row last week. Did not have a super fast car. I thought in, in practice and over the long run. And, and I, fa- comment- I faded him. I faded him with the 22. 22 finishes fourth. Kyle Busch came home third. So that was a fun matchup. Yeah, you love to lose by a spot. That's your favorite thing to do. Oh, if you, I mean, you need, I've mastered it. If I could take plus one and a half, like there you have you available in golf, I mean, this NASCAR season for me, which has been good, I mean, I might be able to buy a beach house somewhere in Southern California to be able to hang out with you and your lovely wife when you guys take uh, November, December, January, and February <laughs> January off sure. until the Daytona 500 yeah. rolls around. Yeah, I, I. So this is something that you know I've been. I think I've talked about it on this podcast before. But they've made some pretty good adjustments on this car. And he faded early last week at Richmond, but he was able to hang around. And what you the thing about these cars that fade early at, at tracks, whether it doesn't matter the track, whether it's Richmond, Michigan, Pocono, Darlington, those guys are able to, to work on their car a little bit and get better relative to some of these guys that are already hooked up, right? If someone just goes to the lead right away, they're making adjustments that make their car even better. But it's usually minuscule how they're able to make their car that much better now of course there's certain situations where you end up like a a kyle bush at 
gateway where he kind of runs away with it, or you end up with like a, a true exit Sonoma where he's just the fastest car. Those are a little bit anomalies, but for the most part, these cars that struggle in the first run that were good in practice are able to make adjustments and get better, which is why you see kind of the tail end of the field, not struggle as much late in the race relative to the leader. So I think that that's something that Randall Burnett and, and Kyle worked on this week because he wasn't a very fast car throughout the race. It wasn't, he was never really a threat to win. He was always kind of hanging around, but when the metal met the road, is that what you say? Metal meets the road. Uh, rubber meets the road. The if metal, meets the if road. metal meets the road, that's not typically a good thing for <laughs> the, the driver rubber, or the metal. automobile. I don't know where that ball. came from. When the right, it just didn't sound right. When the rubber hits the road, at least you caught yourself. Meets and the road that didn't sound right. <laughs> it just didn't sound right. When the rubber meets the road, they were able to get a really solid finish. And I think that's important, not necessarily for for Kyle, um, necessarily this week, but it does help kind of for that championship. And he's been great at this track in the past last year. I think that he's probably racing with the other Toyotas, you know, kind of coming down the stretch, unfortunately had a wreck, but that's what happens when you find yourself back in traffic. And this is something that can happen. I can't, I cannot express this enough. If you're on the wrong strategy and you find yourself restarting 30th, you are in that Hornet's nest. And it doesn't matter if you have a short price on a driver and he's restarting 30th, even if it's a, a strategy call that will benefit him down the road or later in the race, you're still back there with guys that have poor handling race cars. You could find yourself in a wreck. So uh, I, I think Kyle's overvalued at this point. I think that, it, you know, everyone always saying if, if you if you look at where Reddick ran well last year, it will kind of follow up with uh, Kyle running well. Reddick was decent last year. He wasn't great. I still think the Toyotas have a leg up over the Chevys this week. And so that's why I'm not interested in Kyle yet at that eight to one price. Twelves are wild with this trio of drivers. Ryan Blaney at 12 to one, Christopher Bell at 12 to one, and the man that you mentioned before in Tyler Reddick. When we look at Ryan Blaney, current form, nothing to write home about. Ninth is his best finish over the last seven races. Six of those seven races, he's been 14th or worse. And his average finish over the last five has been outside the top 20, but he does have three top fives to his credit in his last three trips here and has shown some speed. Christopher Bell, one finish better than 18th over his last five races, continues to have self-inflicted issues with penalties, commitment cone violations, or in last week's case, chasing an uphill battle with a piss poor qualifying run. He's winless on intermediate tracks during his cup career. As far as track history is concerned, he's never finished better than 13th in his four trips to Michigan. And Tyler Reddick, back-to-back top six finishes, came to an end with a penalty-marred Richmond final stage. He had a top three card, had a chance to finish with a podium there, just wasn't able to complete it. Six of his last eight races, though, he's finished 16th or worse. And when you look at Michigan, not exactly a model of consistency. 24th or worse in his last three trips here. Did start sixth last season, but engine issues ruined his day. His best career finish here, 18th back in 2020. So three drivers, relatively short prices, none with a relatively illustrious track history combined with current form, other than Ryan Blaney, who has run well here in the past, but right now ain't running that well overall. No, I mean, he's been super inconsistent with poor finishes. I mean, one top 10 in his last seven races. I mean, it, it's quite clear that Charlotte was just an anomaly. I don't think we're going to see that again. I don't even think we need to discuss Ryan Blaney. He is not a play at 12 to one. If anything, I'd be looking to fade him at this point in the week in matchups. Now, does that mean that he's going to necessarily unload terribly? No, I, I wouldn't be opposed to betting him if he unloads and, and looks fast and qualifies well. But at this point, 12 to one is a pretty short price. If if you want to go out, move on to, to Chris Bell. Keep it moving. Keep the train on the tracks, my hey, friend. He was he was good, really good here last year. Arguably the best car. Again, though, he's made too many mistakes. He's been the best car two of the last three weeks, and and hasn't hasn't shown for anything on that. So you have to be on the right strategy. And again, it's harder to make your way through this field than it is any other place, or as hard as any other place. And, and if you make a mistake you know, early, you might be able to recover, but you're still going to need strategy, which means you're probably going to need a, a caution to fall at a random time. I don't like Chris Bell. Uh, I don't think that last year's Toyota speed necessarily transfers. You know, it could, but at this point, I haven't seen anything that would say that the Toyotas are going to go out there and dominate it. If anything, I feel like Chevy has closed the gap a little bit when you look at the five and the 24. 
not interested in Chris Bell. If anything, you know, he might be a guy I'd be looking to fade. Finally, Tyler Reddick. This is the guy that I do think has some potential upside. He did open at 14 to one. Thought about maybe a, a nibble there, but waited too long. He moved down to 12. Toledo's were great last year, and this is a place where there's a lot of on throttle time. And typically, when that's the case, Tyler Reddick is fast. And you you put a Toyota in there. You know, obviously Bubba's been fast here, and I think that the 23 XI and I think these Gibbs cars are going to be fast. And I, I think that of those three cars, I think that Tyler Reddick would be the play. Well, I mean, you mentioned Tyler's teammate and Bubba Wallace's price has come down a little bit, but still slightly better in terms of the number that you can find in the market at 14 to one on Bubba. Just one top 10 over his last eight races, average finish outside 17th over the last five, four top five so far this season, but three of them came in a three week span of higher horsepower tracks, which you think should translate here. But he has been the buzzy driver, so to speak. Yeah. And this is a far cry from the number that you could have had on the 23 car a season ago at Michigan, where he started last year's race on the pole, finished second, two top finishes over his last four trips here. It almost feels like Bubba can run well, but you'd rather see how he unloads because you're paying a premium for a driver that isn't exactly a model of consent. Yeah, this is an expensive price for Bubba, I feel like, at this point in the week. <sighs> He was fast last week and, you know, one little mistake on pit road and he disappears. So again, Bubba needs to get a little bit of a, out of his own way. He needs to be able to recover a little bit more. And and like you said, this is the public play of the week. I don't know one person that, that isn't all over Bubba this week. And usually when the public's on a dog, someone told me that dog has fleas. So uh, I certainly think that Bubba could be fast. You know, if you're interested in Bubba, maybe look at his, I haven't, looked at all the prices for pole bets, but maybe get a little nibble there. I'm sure it's going to be much shorter than 14 to one, but uh, you know, you still got to go out there and run the race. There's a reason they go out there and they run 200 laps. And at this point, I, I just, he's not quite there yet, but I'll tell you what, when Bubba figures it out mentally, he's, he's going to win a lot of races. So got good it, equipment. He, oh, he's in great equipment. And, and, and we're also kind of under the assumption that the Toyotas are just going to unload well. And, just because Truex and Hamlin are fast does not mean all the Toyotas are fast. That is a completely different scenario. Those guys are world-class drivers that will be competing for this championship. We're talking about Bubba Wallace and Tyler Reddick. We're talking about, you know, a level down when it comes to, to talent, at least at this point in their career. So just because Toyotas or just because Denny and Truex, I think, will be fast does not mean all Toyotas will be fast. Two drivers that I'm mildly intrigued by that I don't think anybody is really talking about in a great capacity. Chase Elliott, again, 16 to one. Come down a touch. I think Circa opened him as high as 17, but 16 is kind of the consensus out there. Joey Logano, we saw him get bet down last weekend at Richmond. His finish, probably not indicative of the kind of car he had most of the day. Felt like he was really a seventh to 10th, 10th place car. Picked up a couple spots on a late restart. But that's what Joey Logano does. He typically mm -hmm. gets better finishes than the car suggests he's going to be able to produce. When we look at Chase Elliott, there appears to at least be a path for him to get in with points if he finishes the regular season strong. I know you may want to play devil's advocate to that. 13th place finish led HMS drivers at Richmond. And this was a stat that kind of surprised me. Over the last seven races, Chase Elliott has been the best performing Hendrick Motorsports driver Crazy. in five of them. Now, seven consecutive top 15 results, not going to necessarily get you paid in the outright market, but he has performed well in some of the head-to-head -head matchups, knowing that he's not going up against the Truexes, the Denny Hamlins, and Kyle Larson's of the world. Second best average finish of any cup driver this season, even while he has lacked race-winning speed. He does lead the cup series and average finish at Michigan right around eighth, despite never having one here. Three top fives, 10 top tens, 144 laps led in 12 races. Only one finish worse than 11th over his last... 12 trips here chase elliott 16 to 1 fair or foul before we get into the 22 of joey logano yeah i he has to show up eventually and if they're putting all these resources into a into the nine car i find it hard to believe that he's not going to have some sort of speed remember that this is a track very similar to pocono where the right strategy can win you the race and i think if chase elliott finds himself out front late i don't care if he hasn't had the best car all day i think he's going to be really really hard to pass i also think it's important to to listen to interviews with with anyone on that nine team as to whether they think they can point their way in or whether they think they have to win a race because that's going to change how we handicap this driver. If he feels like or we hear that he 
that they have to win the race. I don't like him in matchups. Go ahead and take that 16 to one price because you, you don't have to risk very much to get some sort of payoff. However, if they think that they're going to point their way in, I expect them to be very, very conservative with th- their strategy. I expect them to kind of try to, you know, get them find themselves in a top five finish and, and play things very safely. If that's the case and he has a decent race car, I do like him in matchups. And I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go at that 16 to one price, but all of that is probably going to be contingent on how he unloads. If they're all of a sudden struggling to find speed, I think that it's like, hey, we got to win because otherwise we're going to finish 20th. We have to be really, really risky at that point. Maybe take him to win the race, but don't take him in matchups because it's either going to be feast or famine. But if they unload with with decent speed, I actually think that if if they unload with decent speed and someone like Michael McDowell, who's racing to get into this championship or into the playoffs tends to struggle, I would go ahead and take Chase Elliott in matchups because I think that they're going to be very conservative. And I think that they will take this position of, hey, we're going to try to point our way at least to some of these road courses and then when we maybe have a chance to win. But I think, you know, Chase, I could go either way. I think it's going to be important to see how he unloads and how the team approaches it. So if anyone can, you know, here's a a comment or a quote from someone that nine team, my DMS are open. Please let me know because that will affect how we uh, find positions on chase Elliott this weekend. Joey Logano. We've talked about the Fords and some of their struggles arrow wise. I'm not that concerned about his current form, but when we look at Michigan, Joey does have three wins to his credit here. Eight top fives, 18 top tens in 26 races started here. 590 laps led three of the last four trips here, all inside the top eight. Picked up stage points in five of the last six stages. Did win back here back in 2019. And it's a little bit of a sentimental track for Logano. Michigan is the track where he got his first win for Team Penske way back in 2013. Yeah, 16 to 1 on, I feel like Logano is a good price all the time. So I would have no problem with someone firing on that. Obviously, the Fords have done really, really well here. However, last year he was kind of the guy that faded, you know, he was the first guy to get overtaken by those, those Toyotas and kind of faded pretty consistently throughout the day. So I don't know that he has shown the speed, but if you, if you kind of encompass everything it takes to win the race, whether it's strategy, you know, overall speed, uh, just consistency on pit road, this 22 team, might be lacking the speed a little bit, but they're putting those other two things together and getting decent finishes. Now, maybe not win the race, but, you know, maybe a top three or top five price. You could find yourself uh, cashing a nice little ticket there on Joey Logano. I am not getting involved with him at this point this week because I do think, you know, I'd rather see him, you know, unload and see him practice a little bit and, and maybe get that price even if it drops to like a 12 to one price, I, I don't hate Joey Logano at a place where he's won three times. So uh, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Joey's ability to finish above his average running position. This guy tends to do it week in and week out, which is why he's been really hard. Well, he's been, <laughs> except for you, um, you know, it's been hard. I mean, I feel like I'm trying to make it, I feel like I'm making a case to try and bet him in most matchups, but when I bet him in one out of his three or four, I inevitably <laughs> yeah, find the one the driver guy. that outperforms the 22 the 22 Murphy's law, essentially in handicapping NASCAR head to heads. We've gone a little bit long for stage three. So we'll call this NASCAR overtime here. I wanted to get your take real quick on the RFK revival that we saw last weekend, Brad K 25 to one. He has never won at his home track. Chris Busher 60 to one, but this feels like a different animal for the six and 17 to navigate through with a two mile high speed oval. I like both of these guys this week, to be honest. You know, when you factor in the price, Brad Keselowski, I'm not, this is not like a must win. This is not something we're going to try any harder. By the way, Brad Keselowski is trying as hard as he can to win every race. So just because it's his home track, he's not going to press the gas any harder. That's not a thing. However, if it comes to race strategy, they can be more aggressive to win the race. What does that mean? That means you take him more um, in, in higher paying positions not necessarily matchups or or him to finish in the top 10 i'm not saying that that's a bad bet we haven't talked about that you know we haven't seen him unload however you know at this point in the week i I like brad at 25 to 1 i think that usually these guys run very similar both him and chris busher this rfk team they run very close to each other and so it's like an an f1 performance i mean if one car runs well they typically both run well together so if I like Brad at 25, I sure as hell like Chris Busher at 60 if they run similar 
uh, week in and week out. So I like both these guys. I think that there's a chance I even nibble a little bit of Chris Buescher before we see practice and qualifying. I trust him as a driver. I mean, he he not only did he have a great uh, great drive last week when it comes to just not making mistakes, but he also had to he had to take on Denny Hamlin and and some guys on a restart, which is not easy to do. So, and he went out there and he kind of crushed them and he, he ran a great race. So I think Chris Busher is, uh, you know, he's a threat week in and week out. And I think these 60 to one numbers, we got to take advantage of them now because I think we're going to see those drop in the future. All right. We're putting a bow and waving the checkered flag on stage three around these parts. We've covered a lot of the marquee drivers and those that will most likely factor in, to victory lane this weekend you can follow chris on twitter that's at chris wormy 15 i'm todd Furman. you can follow me there and as always follow all things bet the board at bet the board pod and wormser when we close the book on this fine show we do have one final order of business to transact and that's identifying a best bet opportunity my friend where are you taking us in the pre-week markets Well, I'm going to take an underdog in a matchup. This is at Caesars and Will Hill. William Byron plus 110 over Chris Bell. I I don't think that there's been a race the last few where I've I've been more confident in a driver to to unload fast. I think that William Byron's going to, not only is he going to unload fast, he's going to qualify well. He's going to kind of run top five all day. And hopefully he just has one of those races where he doesn't make any mistakes against a guy who could be fast and just tends to make a lot of mistakes. I think they have the wrong guy favored. And so at, at the Will Hill and Caesars, I like William Byron plus 110 over Christopher Bell, a guy I hate betting against, but with this price, they have the wrong guy favored. All right. Christopher Bell, my outright pick to win this weekend at Michigan, knowing exactly where you're going. <laughs> when you're fading the driver that you love more than almost anybody else yeah. out there, not named Kyle Larson or Kyle Bush, we know how this goes. But yeah. shop around. Uh, Caesars has that head to head plus a dollar 10 on Willie Byron against Christopher Bell. All right, Wormser, uh, bid you a fond farewell, a job well done as we have navigated through the betting board trying to identify a winner at a track that you don't love quite as much as some. And after we leave the two-mile oval this weekend, we get to go road course racing, back-to-back weekends at Indy where they apparently have moved the start-finish yeah. line, which if should that's benefit the case, immensely. We can bet it. Watkins Glen, we know, is a track where we can make a few dollars, and then Daytona basically is a bye week for you where we can almost take the week off, shoot the shit, and try and figure out who may be able to secure one of those final playoff spots. Spoiler alert, I'll probably have bet every Shane Van Gisbergen matchup against him before we record the podcast on Wednesday, depending on how the market prices him. But that's a different discussion for a different day. So for Chris Wormy, I'm Todd Furman and all of the people around the bet the board home offices want to wish you the best of luck this weekend with wherever your investments take you for the fire keepers 400 and with a William Byron ticket in hand against Christopher Bell come Sunday afternoon. We'll see you at the window.